The Ford Mustang Mach-E. This is Ford's first earnest attempt into the EV marketplace, and they've chosen a familiar brand, the Mustang brand. And now moving forward, the Mustang is broken up into two separate products. You have the traditional Mustang Coupe and their EV CUV, which this is. The particular vehicle we're working with is a premium Mach-E. And just like the regular Mustang, there are about 9 million different trim levels. So we're gonna do our best to focus on this premium model, walk you through its cabin, show you some of the engineering that goes into this product and take it for a drive. Enjoy. The interior space. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. Ford is entering a very competitive marketplace. And this marketplace, the EV one, is for better or for worse, the future of most brands. With companies like Porsche and Audi Group moving away from all internal combustion engines, you have to imagine companies like Ford, GM, and the Korean car companies are also moving that direction. And because of that, and the price point and segment that this vehicle's in, it's competing with another American brand called Tesla. And once you remove a lot of the Mustang design cues, like the Mustang logo on the door sills and the pony on the steering wheel, you are left feeling like a lot of this design comes from the Model Y, like the ginormous center tablet and the very simplistic dash layout. And that's not a bad thing, right? This definitely has a more contemporary feel. And I will say this, unlike the Model 3s that I've been in, this car does not have any rattles or squeaks and it feels of equivalent material choice. They've done a good job in this cabin for the most part. The design layout is fairly traditional and there's a lot of storage in this cabin. Uh, I will say this, however, Ford traditionally has not been a software company. They've made cars and they're moving into a marketplace that Tesla's been in for a very, very long time. So they're gonna have to play catch up. They don't have the cycles of learning of that company. They've not been working on a giant touchscreen UI that controls every, everything for the same amount of time. So this definitely feels like more of a beta product. However, with things like over the year updates, your experience may vary. Meaning my experience today might be radically different than your experience in a couple months as they patch up many of the bugs and delays that I've been dealing with with this head unit. And they could also change the software over the air as well. So with that said, let's talk about the ergonomics of this cabin before we talk about really everything else, which is this head unit. The ergonomics are great. You have great visibility in this car. You have good headroom, a lot of legroom. The seats are very, very comfortable, and there's a ton of storage for the front occupants. The rear seats are reasonably comfortable. You have good legroom. Your headroom is a little compromised with the sloping design of this roof line, but the sunroof is a very welcome addition to this car. It lends itself to this nice airy feel, and the hatch space is pretty usable. It's not the largest thing I've ever used, but this is gonna be your only car, you should be fine. So. Let's talk about the infotainment and what you're really interacting with. I'm very happy that Ford decided to keep a more traditional instrument cluster to show things like your speed, what gear you're in, or your gear selector setting, park, drive, reverse, low, and your range right in front of you. So you don't constantly have to look over at this giant tablet when you're looking at simple things like your speed. That's a very, very nice feature. And I wish, again, I was in something like a Model 3 or Model Y, but I digress. Let's talk about the infotainment and the software. And this is where the lack of cycles of learning, the fact that Ford is traditionally not a software company, really starts to show. I've run into a lot of stability issues, unlike my time in Tesla's. This thing has crashed a couple of times, and Apple CarPlay specifically fails to connect almost all of the time. It's extremely annoying. And because it's in control of everything, you have to interact with this tablet for HVAC controls, drive modes, driving aids, parking cameras, and all of your various settings with this vehicle, it is very complicated and the menu structure itself is not particularly logically laid out and it's hard to jump from the various menu settings themselves. And because they haven't put a search feature in this, like again, Tesla has, um, it's not the easiest thing to navigate. And that's really just an oversight that comes from, I think, not spending a lot of time in this segment, really, the software segment of developing cars. Now, lastly, the range. 
And this is one of the nice things about this car that's baked into the software. This car tracks your driving habits to best calculate your range. And you have to reset it, or you should reset it, between drivers, which I'll show you how to do here, uh, to best accurately track the expected mileage out of your vehicle. So with all of that said, let's head in the shop and put this thing in the lift. Underneath the brand new Mach-E, this is mastery and marketing, Jack. Yes, they took a well-known nameplate, and as we're about to show, you're going to see a life-changing marketing video from Ford. The new Mustang, which Ford Motor Company showed for the first time today. When I drive by one of my Mustangs, I get thumbs up from everybody. It's really cool. This car... It needs not to lose what it is. The team was trying to show to the customers that we have this incredible technical capability. It was going to be a great battery electric vehicle, but it wasn't going to be an emotional heartbeat. It was just a car. And when I first saw it, that's the very reason why I said, oh boy, Houston, we have a problem. The vehicle looked like a science project. I thought to myself, who's going to want to buy this car? Ford stands for much more than just meeting kind of environmental regulations. We needed to do something that was going to be state of the art, cutting edge, and exciting. We wanted to deliver something that was magical. And then we started to ask ourselves, what would get people excited about an electric product? And it was actually Jim Farley who suggested, what if we made it a Mustang? It means iconic. It means stylish. You can feel the power, hear the noise, and squeal the tires. It just makes you feel good. It needs the attitude of a Mustang, the feeling of when you're driving it. I would capture that in the form of a utility vehicle. It couldn't possibly deliver upon the Mustang promise. When I saw that it was going to be an SUV, I really dug my heels in. Mustangs are two doors, not four. They're a coupe, not an SUV. And we were doing a four-door SUV electric. That really lit a fire under us, because it's one thing to have a little bit of a design language. It's another thing to say that it's wearing the pony. You can put the Mustang emblem on, on anything, and people will know what it is, on hats, shirts, because that emblem is legendary. The minute we called it a Mustang, everybody redoubled effort. Here's what I could bring to this. This is what more I could do. Please, can we do this? You know, a lot of people hit an age where they love Mustangs, but they also have children, and it's not the most practical choice for them. So this vehicle, you can put your family in it. It's going to be great. Our challenge was, how do we combine technology with this iconic American muscle car and have it actually fit together? We want to interpret technology in new human ways, not just for the whiz-bangy part of it, but the way people will love to use it. We were considering that this would be the most connected vehicle ever. All of the ecosystem that you carry with your mobile phone inside the car. Now, Jack, when this was first announced, I watched that video and I literally laughed the entire time because they are not fooling anyone and they know it. But from a business perspective, to be completely fair to Ford, they have so many resources, so many people working on this, that if you were in a time machine right now and you went to 2040 and somebody's like, hey man, you remember the 2020s? And they're like, oh yeah, that's when every car had to be an SUV or CUV. It couldn't be anything else because that is all people are buying. Yeah. So if you want to launch a new EV, you want to have safe branding, much like why are there not new movies or creative ideas because sequels sell. You already have one of the biggest recognizable brands in the world with Mustang. Yeah, it's a recognizable IP and they really did double down. There is everyone, in, everyone you talk to in Ford <laughs> will tell you that this is a Mustang. And because right. it has Mustang badges and you have Mustang themed modes, it is one. So stripping that away, let's talk about what this is in reality. Okay. This is Ford's first push to a global EV architecture. And this finds its roots actually in a heavily modified variant of what's found on the Ford Escape. However, obviously this is dramatically different as the entire middle structure of this vehicle is filled with batteries. The batteries themselves use a larger cell design and fewer cells than many of their competitors because they believe it's more stable. I'm gonna say this right now. We didn't get any engineering support <laughs> on this video at 
all. And no one I talked to at Ford was willing to give me squats. So hopefully in the future, when we do one of the fast two variants of this, I can fill in some of the bits and bobs. What you get here in the front though, is aluminum strut suspension and a steel rear suspension, which is a multi-link. I will say this, Jack, because we're not gonna delve into what this really is in <clears throat> terms of engineering, what it is right now is version 1.0. Yes. Okay, it's 1.0 for an EV product that they are going to do the same thing they did with the Mustang, the gasoline powered one. Have 25 different variants and versions and trim levels and special editions that you'll never remember all of them. But this is the first one. So this to me is like the four cylinder or six cylinder yeah. Mustang. It's the softest one. It's the most accessible to everyone. It's the most uh, generic. And I think over time, they will make it much more special where possibly it will be the replacement for the gasoline Mustang. Because if you've watched any of our videos, you'll know my opinion on this. We're in the last days of these high performance gasoline powered cars. This is the future. Yes. And in 20 years again from now, when we take that time machine, we're gonna have maybe one gasoline powered car that's got some exemption to be on the road as a specialty car and every other car we're talking about is gonna be EV. And or if you're coming from power. a regular Mustang, if you're coming from a four cylinder Mustang, not a Shelby right. or a high horsepower V8 variant, this power plant, or this, I guess these power plants, as in this case, you have two motors, is extremely competent. It's faster than what you'd get in a regular four cylinder Mustang. So quickly, today in 2021, you can get an upcoming GT model, which is a dual motor, all wheel drive variant. So there's motor in the front, motor in the rear, and it's supposed to be the fastest variant with a sub zero to 60 time below four seconds. You have this premium Mach-E, which is a dual motor without an extended range. And then the base poverty model is a single rear wheel drive model. And they also have a extended range model as well. And really, by the time you're watching this, maybe in the future, none of this is gonna apply because all of this is gonna change yes. game, time over time. Again, as battery pack size increases, evolves, the motor technology might even change. So that's why I'm saying this is not something that's gonna be static. And with over the year updates that they're gonna be able to do, much like Tesla and most manufacturers are going to, cloud storage for data acquisition mm -hmm. on what is being done and how they can improve it real time. This is the future of cars. It's basically a rolling piece of software with two electric motors, and most of these cars are gonna feel identical for a long time. It's just how much character they are they building in. The last thing I'm gonna say about the Mustang SUV or CUV is the reason Mustang exists is not because of the GT500 or the GT350 or the Bullet or the Mach. One, One yeah. it's the volume movers. For the regular people that appreciate the heritage and what the image is of the Mustang, they are not the hardcore enthusiasts. That's not why it's the number one selling like pony car. Yeah. This represents in Ford's vision, the next generation of a mass adoption of an EV, combining all the things that make the more affordable Mustangs good into this next generation product. And they're hoping people are going to buy into that. And I think that they will. And Ford has the resources, hopefully, to come up with an infrastructure to support these vehicles mm -hmm. when it comes to EV charging. Before you take this out on the road, that's the last thing I'm gonna bring up. If you are an early adopter to this, Ford, at least here in the Chicagoland area, does not have the best infrastructure in place, unlike Tesla mm -hmm. does with the, the quick charging network. So that's something to note when you buy this thing. It's really regional, and it's yeah. the same reason why certain cars are California only mm -hmm. when they launch. We just don't have good infrastructure in a lot of areas, and even in our driving. You know, we're having to plan out how we're gonna film because it takes 30 minutes to get to one place to another, and by the time you're done, you're, you're on a charger, and we don't have like a spot where you're like, oh, let's just charge it in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So again, Problems right now yes. that won't be here in 10 years, but again, that's the conversation in 2021. Let's get this out on the road where Jack is no longer available to drive with me because of liability purposes. He's just too fast. <laughs> so I'm gonna take, the, uh, take on the responsibility of explaining everything, how this really feels to drive in a very serious manner. Enjoy. The brand new Mach-E the next generation of EVs from an American car company other than Tesla. Let's take a look at what makes this interesting to drive.
<laughs> all right, so you're gonna have, or at least I'm going to judge this differently than I would a Tesla product. Tesla hasn't had the luxury of manufacturing automobiles for what feels like 5,000 years. They had to start from the ground up. Ford has does not have to do that. They just have to build another car with an EV drivetrain. So this had better be good and fix some of the deficiencies that the Tesla products have. So getting in here, we talked about the interior, we talked about the technology. And, you know, I gotta say, much like I talked about the interior segment, it feels like they were benchmarking the Tesla Model 3 or Model Y. I mean, it just feels a lot like it from the way that the seats are to the steering, but there has been some improvements in other areas. They did do a lot of glass, but you don't have the reverberation that you get out of the Model 3, which is really welcome. So you can carry on a conversation. Your audio system doesn't sound like an echo chamber. And there's other little things that they do well here. But the main thing you're gonna wonder is, they're, they're, they're dealing with the marketing part of trying to sell an EV and using the Mustang name. Is there any connection here or is it just kind of a completely different car? So let's talk about three things that I'm gonna that, that I picked up driving this. One is the suspension tuning. You, I've noticed more so than in many cars I get into a lot of this. My head is constantly bobbing and rolling around. And what this is pretty much indicative of is the car is underdamped. It is very soft. So the dampers are are great with compression, but they need more rebound. So it gives you this kind of like floaty ride. And it being de designed in Detroit, it makes sense why they went on the safe side to give you a little bit of float. This is gonna be more of a GT car, a touring machine. The second thing I've noticed is yes, it's rear wheel biased. So you get that rotation feeling, and when you turn off the traction control, it feels like it lets you off the leash a little bit more but the programming that they've done between power delivery, so braking, then back on the throttle, here it rotates, and then it kind of like pulls you back in where you don't have to do a bunch of correction. The engineers in Ford went really safe. They knew that people are probably gonna try to have some fun with this, but they don't want them killing themselves. So the way that it eases back onto power is real progressive. The way that the traction stability control work is really seamless and smooth. It's very natural. So that gets us into the braking system. And this is where this car is very strange. I would say that out of two things they need to improve and they probably will do it with different trim levels is they need adaptive dampers in here so it's not super soft. It's just way too pillow pillowy and there's not enough body control. The brake calibration is so weird. So you get hard on the brakes. I mean, that was 20 to 30 percent brake force and i'm not kidding it's like the the pedal is really firm so it gives you this feeling like okay you have a lot of braking confidence but it goes from like this regen mode right into full braking and it's really unnatural and it's not progressive at all and to make matters worse when you really need to brake it just basically goes into a full on state where it is like giving you all the power, but it doesn't feel like it's stopping that quick. And some of that is because there's so much nosedive. The suspension is so soft that the braking confidence isn't that great. And then you have the body motion on top of it. You have this heaving effect. And that's what I will say about this Mach-E is that it feels like you're riding on top of the car and you're just on a, like an amusement ride versus having really good solid control. So this to me is definitely one of those that will be great on the highway, super soft all the time, but not engaging to drive whatsoever. The novelty of the, <laughs> the electric motors are there, there's enough torque that gives you that throwback feeling, but it doesn't make power as you keep going. It doesn't build more like a Tesla. And I know they're gonna have different trim levels, more power, different drivetrain stuff with motors. So that's all gonna improve. But as a first gen car, you buy this as a total highway cruiser, as a plush rider, 
and that's about it. So when we get to things like the other gimmicks with the drive modes, you have Engage, which kind of blends soft and then high performance together. You have Whisper, which I keep it on all the time. It's the quietest setting. It's the most lackadaisical setting and it's best for maintaining your battery life. And then you have Unbridled, which, you know, really it turns on the propulsion sound. It kind of changes the tuning of the throttle and the braking. So everything is software here. I would say for me in this car, leaving it on Whisper was the best experience. Now the propulsion sound, Ford has a marketing piece on how they design the engine sound or the fake noise that you get in here, which sounds like pole position on an Atari, but you gotta listen to this. Everyone knows the sound of a Mustang. This doesn't have that. So what are you gonna do? So we asked ourselves at first, what should it sound like? And came out pretty quickly, authenticity's key. So we started to use VR tools and sound tools and studio tools so that you could immerse yourself in what this car could be because it will have a unique sound that it emanates from the vehicle. Once you hit trigger drive, the vehicle's gonna start coming at you. It'll stop next to you. It's more pleasing. And with the character of the car, it's more fitting. Outstanding, fantastic, love it. Thank you guys. No, I'm not kidding. The first time I saw this video and I saw them discussing this, I spit out my drink and I never do that. I thought it was just, <laughs> I died laughing. It is the most preposterous marketing crap ever, but this is the stuff they had to look at all these different things trying to create a new car and sound is one of them. And I think this is the, f the future of EVs. You're gonna have all this weird sound, this fake noise, it's a lost opportunity not to let users upload their own or create multiple sound profiles. If you're gonna do it, do it all the way. Don't just have one sound that sounds basically like a video game mixed with a CVT. You gotta do it better. And I think they have a good start here. But again, you know, this is a first generation product. So there's gonna be all these things they're gonna need to stitch together to make this just evolve it and be better. But let's get into the final thoughts and I'll talk about the pros and cons of the Mach-E as a whole. The Ford Mustang Mach-E. Now, this is Ford's first real attempt in the EV marketplace, and if you're someone who really values what Ford's doing with this vehicle, you will be blown away. As a first attempt, Ford should be commended. The power plant or powertrain works flawlessly, it's got good range, it's plenty quick, and the programming of the throttle pedal is great. It feels a lot like a regular car. Ford purposely has avoided some of the quirkiness by design that Tesla has, which I appreciate, and there's a good attention to detail throughout the cabin and exterior styling. And the Mustang branding is a plus if you like that. Now the negatives are, it feels like a beta product. Ford lacks the infrastructure to support this. The UI and the infotainment is not particularly stable, at least in my experience. And the suspension tuning, much like Tesla products, isn't quite there yet. However, if you value what Ford is doing and you really like this new direction for the Mustang brand, you should go out and buy one. Ford is fully behind this product and I expect a lot of my issues with it will be solved over over-the-year updates. Minus, of course, the suspension tuning. So I hope you enjoyed watching and I hope to see you soon. <laughs>